This video is rated B for you'd better back on out of here if you don't want spoilers, buddy. We are still capable of creation magic. It's true. The idea of creation magic has existed for as long as our star can remember, and it still persists to this day. The principle of allowing something limited to your mind to be brought forth into reality is what some would consider the realm of gods. However, while the truth is a whole lot more simple than that, its execution is surprisingly complex. I am the Synodic Scribe, and today let us begin an open discussion about the nature of creation magic. The first thing we need to understand is that creation magic is an extremely broad category. More often than not, it's used as an umbrella term that encompasses many different magical arts. So, for the sake of simplicity, how do we define it? Creation magic, by definition, is any magic that is capable of creating something that did not previously exist. As you can already guess, this definition is not only broad, but could cover many things. Which, unsurprisingly, it does. During the Unsundered Age, almost everything magical that an ancient created fell into this category simply by the virtue of them projecting their thoughts or desires out into the world and making it manifest into reality. It's not an exaggeration to say that creation was their culture. They used their magic to create buildings, weapons, items, and even creatures out of nothing but aether. Although, despite this magic school's seemingly limitless potential, there were caveats. In order to wield creation magic properly, you need to not only possess the creativity to clearly imagine these things, but the focus to bring them into reality as you pictured it. This is why the ancients had things called concepts, which were essentially blueprints to follow in order to create something down to its most complex components. This is why vision and focus were so important. For example, if you were trying to create a sword, but suddenly thought about a hammer halfway through its creation, you might end up with some kind of bladed hammer, an item that's caught in between the two things you were thinking about even though it wasn't exactly what you were trying to make. That being said, those lacking the creativity to clearly envision something and those too scatterbrained to remain focused on that thing would ultimately struggle with using creation magic. It wouldn't be impossible, but they'd certainly be limited. But this is how creation magic was understood before the Sundering, so what form does it take now? Well, it's more or less the same, really. Any spell you cast or ability you use that forces Aether to come together into something that wasn't there before is technically creation magic. Examples of this would be the Dark Knight's Living Shadow, a Red Mage's Magical Blades, Ninja's Bunnies, and even a Summoner's Carbuncle as well as their Summon Spirits are all technically fulfilling the definition of creation magic. Yet not all magic is placed in the same creative category. For example, black magic has less to do with creation and more to do with direction. A black mage asserts control over the etheric wheel, commanding the elemental energies present in all things to be made manifest. A black mage is simply guiding the already existing aether within themselves or around them into something more direct. Comparatively, this spell school doesn't take a large level of creativity, as you're simply moving energy and not trying to make anything. You're not telling the aether to become something it couldn't already be, by forming it into massive ice crystals. But if you were to create unique and detailed objects out of nothing but ice, now you're getting closer to what creation magic actually is. However, even with all this being said and done, hardly anyone would call what people achieve in the seventh astral era true creation magic. And why is that? Well, that all comes down to one singular word. This word draws the line between our modest version of creation magic and what the Asians were truly capable of. And that word is persistence. The ability to make your creations persist long after you've finished making it is what ultimately separates us from the ancients. It's true, we're able to create things from nothing using Aether just like them. But the difference is that the things we make only last for so long, usually falling apart or disappearing within a minute's time. 
or less. This makes sense, as the sundered source is currently only four-sevenths its original etheric density. There's simply not enough aether to reinforce the things you're trying to create and make it persist indefinitely. This is why the ancients of Elpis are visibly worried about things lacking etheric density. They understood that the less aether something has, the more likely it was to fall apart or disappear. This is also the reason why no one would consider what we can accomplish as true creation magic, even though you are creating things with magic by definition. In order for mages to make their creations persist, they need help in the form of something that's able to ground the things that are trying to manifest into reality. A good example of this would be golemancy. Golems are able to persist without the need of excess aether, but they weren't created from the caster's magic alone. Some form of body was already constructed, and then the life-giving energy was made to fill its empty shell. By extension, carbuncles are much the same way. Whenever a carbuncle is created, they're never just etheric constructs. The gemstone on their forehead is a material item, something that roots its existence and allows them to persist for extended periods of time. But this isn't a perfect loophole. Many things created this way still need a gentle flow of aether from the caster to continue existing, with only heavily refined golems being able to operate at maximum power long after their caster is gone. Be that as it may, not all is lost, as there is a new race that still remember the old ways of true creation magic. These creatures are none other than the Loperates of Mare Lamentorum. Despite the source being sundered, the Loperates are still able to understand what would be considered true creation magic, the same mystical arts used by the ancients. However, this doesn't mean that these adorable little bunnies are as powerful as the ancients were. Far from it. When it comes to raw arcane potential, they've yet to demonstrate any real proficiency. But their fundamental understanding of how creation magic works is what allowed them to develop so many things on the moon without unique resources. They simply created what they needed when they needed it. Without the knowledge of true creation magic, what the Loperates accomplished may very well have been impossible. So, where does that leave us? Well, if what modern mages are capable of wouldn't be considered true creation magic, then we simply need to be re-educated on the fundamentals of it. And what better tutors could be gained than those who were created by Heidelin herself? Indeed, there is still much we can learn from our sprightly little friends now that they don't have to worry about shepherding lost souls across the vacuum of space. I can think of few topics more interesting than the knowledge Heidelin blessed them with, and how it might deepen our still limited understanding of Aether. With there likely being no more rejoinings in the future, the source may forever remain at four-sevenths its original power. So we'd best get comfortable with what we got, and learn to make the most of it. But that will be enough from me for now. I hope everyone enjoyed today's open forum about the nature of creation magic. And in the meantime, I've more research to perform and theories to craft. So, until next we meet, stay safe my friends. Thank you all for watching to the end. If you enjoyed this video, why not subscribe and share this with your fellow adventurers? With your help, I'll try to reach out even further and bring even greater stories to you. Although, I'd be remiss if I didn't acknowledge my biggest contributors. A grand thank you to Papaya Cyan, Rovacus, Potato, Burn My Pancakes, The Yellow Couch, Sage Mouse, Vavalisoma, Cezani, Azuri, Nahil, and Ket, with an additional nod to the scholarships on screen. Links to things like my Twitter and that of my channel artist Caddy can be found in the description. Thank you all for your viewership, as well as your support. And I hope all of you have a wonderful day. Class dismissed.